On this episode of Ask Dr. Bitcoin, we're going to discuss how to recover your long lost wallet and we're going to talk about the project Ryblox. Stay tuned. <music> Well, hello there. I'm Mark Risen Hopkins. I'm a blockchain and cryptocurrency enthusiast who's been studying and learning about the space since 2011. And today we're going to talk about two topics that I hear questions about quite a bit. We're going to talk about one of the possible solutions to the scaling issue you have with Bitcoin. Why it's so expensive? Why is it 10 to $40 per transaction? And another really big question I hear a lot is, hey, I had Bitcoin I bought back in 2011. How do I recover that? We're going to talk all about both of those things today. So stay tuned. So today we're going to talk about how to recover your lost Bitcoin wallet or cryptocurrency wallet or any other type of uh, token wallet that you may have lost track of sometime in the last five years. And now you realize that the money in that wallet is actually worth something and you're kind of wondering if you can get it back. This is a question I hear a lot. This is not a very long section, but it's going to be detailed and it's going to give you the information you need to determine if it's even recoverable. My number one piece of advice is going to be to find the nearest crypto nerd or Bitcoin dealer. Most folks that you uh, will run into that uh, have been in the business for a while, been in, in any business of cryptocurrency, will probably do this for you and charge you a 10% finder's fee or something like that to pull your, your cryptocurrency together. Uh, in many cases, if you're not particularly computer literate or technologically literate, it's money well spent, uh, particularly if it's found money. They're going to ask you a, a lot of questions that we're going to cover today. So it might be better to kind of kind of go through this and determine whether or not your information is recoverable before you go down the road of uh, you know trying to, to find all the information that you need to, to pull this thing together. So we're going to go kind of triage this list. What the number one question you want to ask yourself is, was this on the web somewhere or was it on a PC? This is like kind of the first bit of triage. On the web meaning, was it on an exchange? Was it on a web wallet? Uh, or was it on uh, some sort of online only wallet? Uh, that is generally not a good thing uh, because websites come and go, as particularly in the world of cryptocurrency. Uh, if you think about it being an exchange, uh, and that was an exchange from 2011 or 2012, a lot of those exchanges no longer exist, like MT Gox or, or uh, BTCE or these other types of exchanges that were either shut down because of malfeasance or they were hacked or the, uh, you know, the government seized some of the funds. Uh, your, your Bitcoin could be gone. Uh, and certainly if uh, the company no longer exists, uh, they're, they're, you have no claim to that Bitcoin anymore. Um, so that would be bad news. If you also used a web wallet that no longer exists, uh, that's a problem as well uh, because whoever was uh, the custodian of your cryptocurrency is the one that would be holding the private keys. We've discussed in the past what private keys are and if, uh, why it's better to have them in your custody rather than leave them in somebody else's custody. Um, but let's assume maybe the web wallet does still exist. Maybe it was blockchain.info or it was one of the, uh, like btc.com uh, or one of the other web wallets that still is around. Uh, some of those actually do allow you to have custody of your own private keys. That's a good thing. In that case, uh, you just need to recover access to that account. So whenever you set up that account, likely it gave you a 12 to 24 word passphrase. If you go back to the episode we were setting up uh, Green Wallet or uh, Coinomi or any of these other wallets, uh, those will uh, kind of walk you through what that process looks like. You simply take that 24 or 12 word phrase, put it into any modern Bitcoin wallet and you have recovered your Bitcoin. Let's say it's one of those uh, online wallets that did not allow you to have custody of your private keys. In that case, your only course of action uh, would be to, if in, like in the case of btc.com or localbitcoin.com, is to go through their technical support and see if you can remember your username or your password or your two-factor authentication devices and actually go through and recover the, uh, the, the account that you had at the time, just as you would recover a Gmail account or some other type of uh, web-based service. But... Um, there is this other category. Let's say it was on your computer. Uh, that was a very common thing in the uh, early uh, 2010s uh, with cryptocurrency. Uh, most people kept their cryptocurrency on a local machine. Uh, so it was called the QT wallet or the, uh, the core wallet. Uh, and they, all these wallets for all these various cryptocurrencies functioned essentially the same way. There were variants of the same code. You're looking for a wallet.dat file that exists somewhere 
uh, within uh, the computer that you had. So the questions you have to ask yourself there are standard data recovery questions. Does the machine still boot? Has the hard drive been reformatted? If the hard drive hasn't been reformatted, can you take that hard drive out and put it into a machine that does boot? When you get that up, then you just do a simple directory search uh, that allows you to do a recursive directory search for a wallet.dat file. If that's above your pay grade in terms of technical ability, uh, there's uh, several tutorials online. If you simply Google wallet.dat file location, you can actually pop that in, that file location into the op operating system that you use and determine exactly where that dat file is. From that point, if you have possession of the wallet.dat file, that is all of your private keys and your public keys. You can simply download the latest version of whatever wallet you're talking about, whether it be Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever, buy, download the latest version of the QT wallet and install that wallet.dat file into the import uh, feature and you'll have access to all of your Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or whatever, whatever uh, crypto it was that you lost access to originally. And that's it. So today we're going to talk about the project Ryblox. It's a new form of, well, it's not exactly new. It's a form of cryptocurrency that's taking uh, center stage right now due to its rising in value. But it really uh, is an interesting project. It could potentially solve a lot of problems and it's based off of one of the more ancient forms of money. So we're gonna talk about that and kind of explain the whys and hows and, and what concerns may exist around it. The headline here ought to be is this, this Ryblox project solves the scaling problem. If you look at uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these other cryptocurrencies, the best you're gonna do in terms of transactions per second vary between three to 30 on a good day. Bitcoin uh, is around three to seven or four to seven uh, transactions per second. Uh, Ethereum is significantly higher than that, uh, around uh, 10 to 20 uh, under optimal conditions. Uh, Ryblox is at 7,000 plus transactions a second. It's ridiculous. Interesting concept is actually based on one of the older forms of money to exist. So if you, if you look at uh, Micronesia or Guam or some of like the, uh, the, the, the Pacific Oceania islands back there, they had this form of money that involved these things called rye stones. They were, they were large uh, boulders really that were carved up and representative of money. And the way it worked was that it, uh, uh, would allow you to, uh, there, there, was a, there was an oral history of the money. So it would be, you know, I own this stone or and our own ser several pieces of the stone and I want to buy your herd of sheep over there. And so we orally agree that, you know, this fraction of the stone is worth that uh, fraction of your herd. And then the oral history changes as to who owns that stone and who owns the sheep and life goes on. It was actually interesting um, that, uh, it, so first of all, the stone actually never really change position, it would actually just sit there in the middle of the uh, the village or out wherever it was. On occasion, if a village had to move, uh, like they moved from one island to another, they would take the stone, maybe like on a canoe, and there's one story where they the canoe actually sunk with the stone on the bottom of the ocean, um, but all the villagers agreed, hey, the stone still exists and we can still you know, assume that the ocean hasn't destroyed it, so we're going to continue to use that stone as money, the capital isn't destroyed. Um, there's lots of essays and interesting uh, pieces on that uh, all over the internet. Uh, it's worth checking out. We're gonna talk about the blockchain implementation of this idea. It's similar in concept to the, uh, the idea of Rye Stones. It's a trustless, low latency cryptocurrency that utilizes novel, what they're calling block lattice structure. So I'm gonna clear off our screen here and kind of di diagram that. because there's not a clear button. <laughs> okay, so what they're talking about when they say a block lattice structure, if you look at a, a normal blockchain, we've, we've, we've drawn this out in the past for other examples, it's a chain of blocks, it's, it all exists as one chain, and this is kind of uh, reminiscent of our SegWit uh, uh, illustration right here. So all these, all these transactions get formed into the block, and you have to wait for an available block to show up for your transaction to get dumped into the blockchain. So, <laughs> hang on, this has got to be a clear button. Conversely, with Rye blocks, you don't have one unifying uh, blockchain. Each wallet is a blockchain unto itself. So let's say here we've got 
Matthew, here we've got Andy, and here we've got Rebecca. So each one of these circles in my illustration indicates a block on these individual blockchains. So let's say Matthew is sending Andy uh, one rye block, and then he sent Rebecca five rye blocks, Andy sent Matthew two rye blocks, Andy sent Rebecca three rye blocks. You can see that there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of, I mean, each, each, it's like kind of a checkbook ledger. So it's a, it's a authoritative ledger unto itself. And there's a mechanism within the protocol for there to be a, a unifying, uh, unified record of ledger that appears on everybody's individual wallets. But let's say you've got a, a mobile device. You don't want to store everybody's uh, data, even in a compressed form on your mobile wallet. They have a form of governance uh, called delegative democracy that allows you to assign your authoritative record keeping uh, authority to uh, another node. Um, that makes uh, some very interesting dynamics, uh, especially when you take into account that the Ryblock system is fully mined. There's no more uh, coins or tokens being created on this blockchain and there's no transaction fees uh, at all whatsoever. All these factors put together make for some very interesting economic dynamics as well as some technical dynamics that allow it to be pretty unique in the world of blockchain. So uh, let's go down to the coin distribution details. Uh, as I said, they're fully distributed. There's 133 million and some change XRB out there being uh, used on the blockchain presently. The funds were initially distributed using uh, those what's known as cryptocurrency faucets. Uh, and uh, there was a few contests as well, and there were some held back for the development team as well. Um, the reception was remarkably positive. In fact, I, I only say that because I've, I look and research on tons of these projects online. If you look at Bitcoin talk threads, they're almost always resoundingly negative. Uh, they've, they're trying to pick these projects apart. And in this case, um, from the very beginning up through uh, the present day, there's been no uh, rumblings of fraud or rumblings of uh, malfeasance or anything shady at all. It, they, the, the community has accepted XRB uh, with, with uh, wide open arms. Investment analysis, investment details, as you can see from the chart here, the, uh, the $1,000 invested on uh, the uh, day where they were first available would uh, be at $3.3 million in uh, Q1 of 2018, uh, has gone up and to the right quite consistently and continues to do so. Obviously, the big uh, feature of Ryblox is its scalability. We talked about that. The throughput tests say they can handle in excess of 7,000 uh, transactions per second. They have a no fee structure. And uh, as I talked about the delegative democracy, it's a form of proof of, uh, proof of stake. They have a proof of work rate limiting uh, system in there. It doesn't have anything to do with authentication or mining. It's simply a stopgap. Uh, anytime you hit a send transaction, it requires just a tiny bit of proof of work to keep you from spamming the network, which is an interesting feature. And I hadn't seen that in many other cryptocurrencies I've looked at. Security. So this is where things start to fall down. And it's not necessarily because this is an insecure protocol. We just don't know. It's not been around for very long. And uh, as a result, it hasn't been tested in the same way that more traditional blockchain architectures have been tested for the better part of a decade. The scalability could be the Achilles heel uh, due to the way that they allow for delegative democracy and have unique uh, block lattice structure as they, as they determined. Uh, the proof of stake delegative uh, system does not have incentive structures that we would traditionally regard as Byzantine fault tolerant. So uh, in that sense, uh, you, might, uh, you might find interesting ways to exploit the network. Going back to our, our diagram here where you've got uh, Andy and, and uh, Matthew making a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, a truly peer-to-peer -peer transaction, uh, it's not clear what in the system would prevent uh, Matthew and Andy from colluding and trying to create a negative balance or create value where none or tokens where none exist and then try to sync that back to the network. Um, the white paper touches on it but doesn't go into enough depth to satisfy my curiosity and of course uh, pen testing uh, hasn't been uh, going on long enough to completely exhaust that as an avenue of attack. So general analysis pros and cons I like it I think there's a lot of potential here uh, cons, uh, obviously, uh, it's, uh, uh, there might be some security issues, but uh, in terms of 
solving the scaling debate, solving the scaling issue with blockchain, this is one of the more promising uh, adventures out in that regard, and it's worth keeping your eye on. Well, there you have it, your blockchain and cryptocurrency prescription. As always, these are just my thoughts, and I encourage you to seek out a second opinion. Subscribe for more videos on blockchain and cryptocurrency, and if you enjoyed today's video, share it with a friend so they can see. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to see the receptionist on your way out. It's just weird to the chair, but also want to be in the frame properly. So yeah, yeah, you're fine. Exactly. I mean, the the it's yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. I just didn't want a, an episode of the Cube where John and Dave were like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sitting at the big kids' table.